Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending a uh, session of V Brown Bag. Tonight, we are continuing with our API discovery. Um, this evening, we're very excited to have Mr. Jad Alzane with us exploring VRA APIs. Um, this, is, this is something that is near and dear to my heart, so I'm very excited for this to, to kick off. Um, first, a couple of uh, house cleaning things. Um, get in on the conversation. I will be monitoring uh, via Twitter the at V Brown Bag and pound V Brown Bag hashtags. Um, so if you if anybody is online that's not in the actual session, which would be weird, um, go ahead and, and post that there. Or if you're in the live session on the webinar, post your questions in, in there and I will pass them on to, to Jad. Um, so with that, Jad, let me pass you presenter. There you go. All right. It's All right. You. One of my cats is going very, very uh, meowy right wondering. now. I was wondering if that was a, a cat or a child. It's it's a it's a cat who who loves to make noise whenever I start talking. So uh, that's that's it kitty. Um, he's he's got a, He's he's got a little bit of an internet following. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. All right. I can see your screen. All right. Very good. All right, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for having me and um, love doing these things because they're casual, they're fun, and we can basically do whatever we want. So hopefully um, this theme of APIs that uh, V Brownbag has been doing, we'll, we'll try to keep that interesting and fun. Um, this time I'm hitting on VRA APIs. Now I understand there's a mixed audience. I got some requests from um, Twitter and, and put some feelers out there on, on what you guys would like to see. And I think what I'm going to do is, first of all, kind of give you a, an overview of, um, of why the APIs and uh, and then just some examples of what we can do from them and then uh, with them and then the, uh, the, the, broader, um, the broader use cases and the broader uses for VRA's APIs. Um, <clears throat> but first of all, you know, why, why are we automating automation? Automation or vRealize automation. Um, hopefully, you're coming into this call with at least a little bit of an understanding of what VRA is, um, because we're going to go right into the APIs here um, with some setup. Um, but if not, obviously, there's a whole bunch of people who'd love to have those discussions with you and, and show you the ropes, uh, including myself, um, we can do offline. Um, but you know, vRealize Automation, I always position it as top of stack or the core of the STDC or the cloud management platform. Um, and it is the abstraction layer um, that plugs into your broader ecosystem and makes it do things, right? And so while VRA is often positioned to be there at the top, um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of desire to also automate VRA programmatically. Um, and traditionally, it hasn't really been the best of interfaces to automate. So why would you automate an automation engine? And that's exactly what I guess VMware was thinking when we were putting all this together. The APIs aren't that critical because it's really, it, it is the beginning of the, uh, the thread, right? Uh, you start pulling the thread in VRA. Now that is nonsense. And um, over the years, we've learned a, a really valuable lesson about Everything needs to start with the API, and then you slap a UI over it. And um, anybody familiar with what VMware has been doing and where we're going, it's become um, it's become very prominent. The API. Um, so while VRA has this spectacular capability, and I'm, I promise I won't be selling anything to you guys today, but uh, you know you'll you'll see the passion and the Kool Aid coming out naturally. Um, while VRA provides a spectacular capability, the desire to also put VRA um, in a corner for those who don't necessarily need to interface with VRA is a critical aspect of it. And with that, we are, you know, we've spent a significant amount of capability or um, uh, effort in building this ecosystem around vRealize Automation and allowing both VRA to automate it as well as VRA itself to be automated through external tools. And to do that, you need a robust API. And that robust API is what we're going to talk about today. Um, now, before anybody calls BS on any Twitter feed, here's the awful truth. It has taken us a while to get here, right? We, uh, we didn't necessarily focus on the API from the get-go. Um, for those familiar with the v VRA's past, you know it's, uh, it's, it was an internal project and an acquisition of Dynamic Ops, kind of 
uh, brought together um, through VCAC and VRA and what you see now. So there was uh, a lot of .NET in there. There was a lot of uh, the, the virtual appliance, the VA, the primary virtual appliance, which is our core endpoint for API um, administration today. So over the years, um, the story's gotten much better. As of VRA 7.2 and VRA 7.3, um, 7.3 especially, and this trend will continue, um, it is safe to say uh, and safe to commit to the fact that you can uh, deploy, configure, build out, um, automate, consume, and lifecycle VRA and all of its components and ecosystems without ever logging into a UI. Now that's significant. Programmatic interfaces into VRA is a, a big focus for us, and it's it's also selfish because with the uh, with some of the APIs I'm going to show you in a bit, and some of the programmatic interfaces, um, we've also have side initiatives um, such as Lifecycle Configuration Manager and some of the announcements we made uh, at VMworld to make our so the entire SCDC stack um, able to be deployed. You know the easy button deploy. Uh, we have to invest in those APIs. And the result of that is what we delivered in VRA 7.3, and that trend will continue into future iterations. Programmatic interfaces in building, deploying, and managing VRA itself is one thing, but I think the vast majority of the customers want to consume VRA programmatically, and, uh, and that's where I'm going to actually focus today. Okay? So um, there's a little bit here and a little bit there. I'm kind of going to be all over the place. If you've got any questions, go ahead and interject um, through the host, and we will uh, we will address address things as much as possible. And I know this hour is going to just fly by, so um, I will continue. Yeah, it is. Now, <laughs> yeah. So so now, if you look at if you look at the screen, this is a an a, an image that has evolved over time. And every version of VRA, I add a little bit of snippet here and there, and post some cool icons that don't necessarily mean anything to anybody but myself. Um, but over here on the right, oops, over on the right, this extensibility component, this is where we come in and out of VRA. This is where VRealize Automation can integrate, automate, and orchestrate a third party or an external ecosystem. And it's also where we're going to leverage VRA APIs as this API um, component coming into VRA so I could make it do things I wanna do uh, over my client of choice. Um, the most obvious one is this guy right here, ServiceNow. I'm, I'm hoping you can see my mouse uh, cursor, if you can confirm. Yes, we can. Um, so a lot of customers who use VRA as like this core automation platform for IaaS and XaaS and, and PaaS and this backend delivery of services, um, they love VRA and it's, we'll, we'll say it's vast nature um, to, to do that from an admin perspective. Uh, but often there are some initiatives um, in the organization that, uh, that provide a consumption model other than VRA. So when we are talking about vRealize Automation and some of, the, some of the capabilities and what you can do and it's the catalog for all and you can deliver all these services, that's, that's all nice and good. And then they say, well, we have service now and that's our consumption portal. Um, so that, that is one major example of where VRA's APIs are often used, right? VRA sits, um, after you set it all up, VRA sits behind ServiceNow from a consumption perspective, and ServiceNow, for example, and other ITSM tools, um, will do what it does best, which is provide a consumption portal while VRA does all the magic in the back end, in that order. Okay, and then you, you'll see some other ecosystem components. All of this leverage the new APIs um, or some combination of APIs and other programmatic interfaces uh, into VRA. But what we're gonna focus on right now is how to consume VRA through self-service. We will skip UI because that's, you know, plain Jane. Um, CLI with the uh, use of Cloud Client. If you don't use Cloud Client, uh, Cloud Client can be your best friend. It's an awesome tool to get up and running really quick and I'll show you a little bit of that. And then of course the API. Uh, just as a level setter, if I can deliver it through a VRA catalog, I can consume it in an API, including all of the um, the artifacts that are or the inputs that are required for that catalog item. 
and I'll expand on that. So why are we automating? Uh, here's a VRA primer. It's to get rid of the blue spot, the, the blue space, right? It's the most expensive, most uh, an annoying and time consuming component of all of this. Uh, when we talk about automation and we have to wait weeks to automate, it's um, counterintuitive and absolutely not where we wanna be. So while VRA can initiate the automation, VRA itself could also be automated because maybe that uh, requires some significant wait time in your environment. In this mixed ITSM uh, slash you know, third-party ecosystem, that's often the case. So as important as it is to automate out, we wanna automate in. To look uh, Real quick, um, the uh, a snapshot of where VRA plays in this whole mess, uh, fun mess, but it's a mess. Um, for both uh, northbound and southbound, uh, we provide the, the tools and the components, so VRA is always playing in the middle, right? It's uh, providing this inbound uh, access to be automated now more than ever, as I've already addressed, as well as this extensibility component outbound. Now, a couple of things while you're looking at this image that may or may not make sense. The extensibility, uh, the extensibility platform in VRA. Um, when I say extensibility, it's what you can do with the, this product and these products that uh, R&D didn't necessarily bake in, into the product. It's not out of the box, right? It's beyond out of the box. So what I mean is you can configure, build, set up some IaaS, uh, build a massive catalog, have multi-tenancy, do all these great things, but sure enough, you're gonna have this requirement to plug into this one tool that has a REST API, but doesn't necessarily have a lot of development behind it. There's no native plugins. There's just, there's just nothing you can do with it. Um, there's also a lot of this custom built-in uh, or in-house built stuff. Um, again, REST API is a great common factor there. Um, so how do I incorporate that? Those become requirements. We can't turn our heads on that. We can't just forget about that. We can't say, well, that was internally built. It's not gonna be supported. So we have this extensibility um, ecosystem. And um, essentially, and you know, you can, of course, it's easier said than done, but essentially, if it's got a REST API, I could automate it. I can deliver it as a service. I can govern it. I can consume it. And I can do all of that through VRA and any of its uh, programmatic interfaces. vRealize Orchestrator being the most popular one. Anybody here who's a VMware customer who owns a vCenter has been a VRO customer. Um, VRO is uh, your best kept secret. Um, it's, uh, it's an amazing tool and it's got its own API and it plays heavily with VRA's APIs, but that is not the focus today. The VRA API is gonna be the focus. Okay, it's just really hard to gloss over that so quickly, but I'm going to uh, charge on because I got stuff to show. Um, so common use cases, right? Automating operations, um, that is uh, extending VRA outwards, right? Consumption, this is the number one use case. Especially when we start talking about some of the new things we can do with VRA, like um, container host as a service, or Docker as a service, or um, requesting hybrid applications through the catalog, uh, or you know, very complex um, the modern applications, purely modern or, or hybrid or traditional IaaS. Now the thing is, when I'm showing uh, Admiral and our sh I'm showing our container integration and uh, provisioning uh, containers through an entitled lifecycle um, uh, process, it's really not a great thing to see the reaction from the DevOps consumers in the room or the container consumers in the room who are like, you've already clicked six times to request this container, I'm leaving, right? And I absolutely respect and expect that. Um, so with everything I've said, you have to also keep in mind there's a whole new audience for VRA. We're expanding um, into areas that an, an IaaS engine isn't necessarily familiar with or really good at. So as VRA evolves into this DevOps enabler, just be very clear what I said there, a DevOps enabler, a provider of services for DevOps folks. Um, it, is, uh, it is absolutely important that we approach it in a way that it can be all programmatically uh, requested. And I have uh, examples on there as well. Now, 
administration, um, IT onboarding, ongoing maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Anything you can do with VRA, basically, we want to be able to um, support that. Confident. This is not confident. I got to remove that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> enhancements from the 7X platform, previous 6X platform. 6X, now I love 6X, right? Um, I, I, I bled 6X for you folks who are familiar with the 6X platform, which was VCAC and before it turned into Realize Automation. Uh, it, it was very obviously a Franken CMP and, uh, and, and we dealt with that and we had some headaches and a lot of customers are still on 6X because once, you, once it's solid, it's solid, right? The, the issue is we had multiple uh, API endpoints. You had to determine: is this a an IaaS.NET call, or is this going into the the new uh, virtual appliance, uh, or probably a, a, a combination of this? Um, the the usability and the overall user experience of consuming those APIs, first of all, hugely limited. Second of all, you could easily end up in a dark alley. Um, there was problems, and that's how I opened this call, uh, understanding that yes, there were problems. Where we are today is completely different. Um, we have provided much cleaner um, interfaces, much better response. Um, uh, the user experience overall is great. I'll show you Postman because uh, you know, I was just watching some of the past stuff and Postman seems to be the, uh, the demo tool of choice. So also, <laughs> I love Postman. And if you're just trying to get into it, it's... Uh, it's <laughs> confident. Thanks, Chris. Um, if you're if you're just getting into this, Postman is is your best friend. It's also a, a great learning tool. Now, a couple people on the call will suggest Python is better, but that's a different different day, different story. I'm looking at you, Cody. So, um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll show you examples of of what we're doing here. Um, now, here's a, a snapshot from VRA 7X, and I say 7X because with each iteration, each version or each release, um, we will expose additional services. Uh, for example, the container service, um, which isn't in this list. Uh, we have the health service, which isn't in this list, um, and the health API. Um, but essentially, uh, the documentation is all baked into the appliance. And we also have, uh, and I'll show you where the external docs are available. Um, in 7.2 and later, we've also made available a Swagger spec. It's all Swagger based. Um, it's really clean, very easy to navigate, and very easy to consume. Um, and, and Puppet is definitely a great way to start. Puppet, not Puppet. Postman. Did I, have I been saying Puppet this whole time? I meant I'm, Postman. We'll, fi we'll find out the recording. <laughs> <laughs> you meant Postman. We know, uh, what, we know what you meant. Yeah, okay. Postman. There we go. So from a usability perspective, um, we wanted this, uh, this this response, and the response leads you into the appropriate next step. Uh, and again, Postman's great for this. Um, so this this uh, the, the hypermedia as an engine of application state, um, or the uh, the this this new um, you know VRA adopted this, I think in seven o. Yep, 7.0, uh, VRA adopted it, and it allows you to very easily understand what the next step is as you do a query, as you get, as you go from get to post, uh, and are consuming this in the the environment. And I'm going to show you all of this in demo, so I don't want to spend too much time here. Um, when you post catalog requests in VRA, um, it's a matter of grabbing that JSON, pasting it into a body, and sending it. You could modify the text, you can uh, modify the requester, and I'll show you some of that as well and you can do everything that your uh, your authority your your authentication is allowing you to do now i'm going to just focus on that for one minute and you're going to uh, just just hear me out i used containers um, as an example earlier the the devops consumers and those folks who want to do a docker run um, are the first people to walk out the room when you say i'm going to I'm going to click six times, right? But then you say, wait, hold on. I've got an API for you, or I've got a single CLI uh, line that you can pull. Okay, you got their attention again. Now, what do you gain when their interface becomes VRA, programmatically or, or through UI, versus their Docker run command? Now, first of all, let me just rewind and suggest that four years ago, Docker was going to eat VMware's lunch, and it was the end of the hypervisor. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. 
Um, in every user con, every presentation, every um, breakout I've, I've spoken to, I, I love doing these surveys. Who here has containers in production? It is usually, I mean, of course there's exceptions, and of course containers have, have done tremendous good, but the amount of adoption has been, the level of adoption has been incredibly limited because there are some key critical business factors missing. So when you do at Docker run and you get that instant gratification, where does ServiceNow sit in or, or your ITSM tools? Where does your CMDB? What about your your um, you know your other governance components? You know how do you how do you archive the fact that that happened? How do you understand that that was allowed to happen in the first place? How do you control access to those applications? Right, all of that is missing when you skip governance. When you skip a control gate that is, in, in my case, in our world, V-Realize Automation. So now, back into this Prezo, I've got these APIs, um, I've got a new consumption uh, model, I authenticate into VRA, based on that authentication, I can consume this infrastructure one way or another. Now, when I do that single liner, whether it's through Cloud Client or over a, an API or, or, or however I wanna consume it, while I can get that instant gratification, by just invoking that query, a hundred things on the side is gonna, are gonna happen. And they're gonna happen in the back end. They're going to happen without my knowledge. I'm just gonna go on and do my thing as a consumer, programmatic consumer of this infrastructure, right? That is so critical. I just wanna make sure everybody understands that. When you authenticate into the system and start requesting services and you're doing it programmatically and you're happy, all the gates, all the governance, all the controls that were in place because this is at the end of the day, a business aligned tool. This allows you to align IT with business, but also modernize IT. All of that is, is implied. All of that is enforced. There is no circumventing those gates. It makes it very important and very a uh, very critical aspect of adopting these technologies and consuming them. Okay, off the soapbox but very important either way. When I go in and I request um, these APIs, I'm going to authenticate. I'm gonna collect a bearer token. I'll show you through, I'll, I'll walk you through all of that. And then I'm going to invoke my requests or, or do my queries. And based on the token I have and the, 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 um, the access I have, I can do all kinds of things. All my queries, all my uh, posts, uh, all of those will respond to me based on that bearer token. No circumventing, whether it's a container or a very complex multi-tier application or if I'm building VRA itself, um, the, the logic of VRA. My roles, my permissions, all of that still applies. Okay, content management. Here's a, another popular use case. It gets its own slide. In VRA 7, we introduced infra as code um, and it's the, it's the ability to um, provide uh, plain human readable text um, as a representation of your blueprints that you build in VRA. Again, if you aren't familiar with VRA, uh, you should probably go get a primer um, so this stuff could make sense when you view it again. But um, YAML allows me to take every representation, UI-based representation of my blueprints as simple or complex as they may be and then view them as infra as code. And I can take that payload and actually use it. I can copy it, paste it, share it, uh, post it, collaborate, put it in Git, do whatever I wanna do with it. Um, and it represents the entire blueprint. Now this isn't quite Tosca standard. It isn't uh, a Terraform. Um, it, is, uh, it is infra as code for the way VRA consumes it. It's all accessible via the API. Um, so I can build my code, uh, build, build the entire blueprint in code, I can post it, uh, I can then publish it and consume it all programmatically as well. So it's, uh, it, it gets pretty deep and pretty complex if we want it to. It's as complex as, as, it, as we want it to or, or not, right? Cloud Client. Um, if you have VRA in your environment, whether it's uh, a lab or production, Get Cloud Client. We're on version 4.4 currently. Um, cloud Client allows us to abstract all the API minutia for you. So they're single liners, uh, plain text, uh, verb-based, very easy to consume, 
and it manages authentication, it manages uh, the, the, the token sharing or the token um, usage, the bearer token, and it manages all the API interaction with uh, backend VRA. The more powerful that API becomes, the more powerful cloud client is. It is a direct correlation. But it is designed to allow you to programmatically interface with VRA without necessarily having to learn an API. So baby steps, right? If you're just getting into this, Cloud Client's your, your, your BFF. Um, if you've already been using Cloud Client, um, APIs are certainly going to help you fill some gaps. Bringing these tools together uh, becomes pretty powerful as well. Uh, me personally, I embed Cloud Client in my virtual appliances and invoke um, Cloud Client commands uh, using extensibility. So whatever the UI can't give me, I just invoke via extensibility. I have it hit the, the command line and execute locally in VRA. It is an awesome combination, uh, and there's uh, very little I can't do uh, with that. And then, of course, I could also do that with the API. So I will show you that. Um, I talked about infra as code. My blueprint's on the, on the left, infra as code on the right. I could, again, write all of this and consume it all uh, via API. Um, and uh, networking and security. I have to plug NSX real quick. Uh, the latest version, VRA 7.3 plus NSX 6.3 and higher, um, goes uh, or stops depending on vRealize Orchestrator. Previous versions required vRealize Orchestrator as my abstraction layer. Um, currently, it's all done through API, and I and I say this because of um, you know the, the power of the API. Integration with a broader suite, vRealize operations. Now we're leveraging both VROps APIs and VRA APIs to, um, to uh, provide some intelligent placement of applications. Instead of VRA saying, hey, let's just round robin placement or make it based on capacity or priority, I'm gonna actually leverage um, VR, VROps APIs, ask VROps, hey, what, what's your idea on, on how I should place this machine since you've got analytics, VROps, consumes a VRA API and responds back and says, here's what I think you should do, and then VRA does the rest. Again, I'm just showing you examples of where we've consumed those APIs. I've discussed service now. Um, that's a very powerful one. Infoblox, an awesome partner. They've done a ton of work in building their integrations. Just huge kudos to them. Great team to work with. Um, and they, they've built uh, big extensibility components um, into VRA. And again, we're leveraging uh, two-way APIs here. Um, event broker for extensibility, property dictionary, all leverages API. And then the newest addition to VRA 7.3 is the health service, also leveraging that API. Um, the health service allows me to see what's up with VRA and VR, VRA and VRO, right? Um, now, the reason I put this slide here is because I wanted to talk about something very cool coming with it, and then I forgot that that thing hasn't been released yet, so I, I can't really get into it, but uh, I will certainly share info on that once it's available. Um, so that was uh, my bad, being overly excited about something. Um, but hint, hint, it has a lot to do with APIs. All right. Now, I flew through that so I could just play for a little bit instead of going through slides. So um, I will pause for one second. Are there any questions that we should address at this point? Uh, let me check. Um, I'm screen scraping your uh, your URLs right there real fast. Um, let's see. We're good on Twitter and we are, we are good locally. Thank you. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Um, first of all, let's talk about resources. It is easier than ever to get started um, with consuming VRA's API. Uh, we've been uh, through VMware Code. We've we've got a, several initiatives, um, and I will I will share these however possible. This is all public. It's all out there. Um, the VR, uh, VMware API Explorer. You can go in there, look at uh, cloud cloud management platform VRA 7.3 or VRA 7.3. And this will walk you through consuming all the, the public APIs for VRA. This was just released um, 
I'm going to say four or five months ago, I was speaking about this. Um, Grand Orchard, a whole bunch of uh, folks on the team were also uh, played a big role in, in advertising and getting the word out here. Um, it's 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 hugely important if you're getting into uh, the, these APIs. So, for example, um, catalog service, I can very easily come in here and uh, look at what's possible uh, with the catalog service APIs, and it just breaks down everything you can do. All right, so start here. Um, it's great information. Uh, you can look at the documentation um, across all of these. This is the Realize Automation Programming Guide that you can download and study up. Uh, and you can look at some code samples uh, because this next piece here is a full stack Postman collection. And uh, this is the latest one for VRA 7.3. Um, that link is available from VMware Code as well, and you could also search it in resources samples. Uh, I don't know how I can get you all of these links, but maybe I'll, I'll tweet them all out uh, after the call, um, okay. or maybe maybe just post them in, in a deck or something and, and share it. If, if you email um, them to me, I can I can put them in there with the uh, in the feed um, on on the uh, on the on YouTube. All right, cool. We'll do so. Um, now, from uh, from from code, you can get a lot of uh, uh, the the uh, Postman uh, the, the the Postman uh, collections. Now, this is very important because not only does it get you up and running in Postman real quick, but the the um, the collection covers the vast majority of the use cases, and it actually presents it. Uh, for consumption in, in a very learning-friendly way, and I'll, I'm going to show you all of this, uh, and, and walks you through a logical step-by-step -step process of consuming um, any one service. Uh, so it's really neat. Um, and then the catalog services is what I'm going to show you that seem to be the most popular ask. Um, and the catalog service will uh, get you through, you know, querying the catalog. Hey, who who am I? What do I have access to? What is the what are the configuration parameters of that thing? And then I'm going to post the request. Um, so I'll do a couple of gets and then a post. In that post, I'll modify the JSON, and voila. Uh, and all of that work is basically done for you um, with these packages. So it's it's really cool, very easy um, to to get in front of. And finally, is the the built-in Swagger docs that are um, that are in the VRA appliance itself. So this is my VRA box, uh, just one of, one of them in my lab. And uh, slash uh, component registry services docs, that's where you're gonna find um, all the Swagger docs. And this is not as interactive as the new vSphere API Explorer, which is phenomenal. Um, this is, but, but it gets very close. Um, what I can't do is, is execute from here at this point. Uh, we can do um, a lot of uh, modeling and a lot of learning um, from from this. This is just to be um, very transparent. I did a lot of my learning um, in the 7.0 APIs from just reading the heck out of the built-in docs. Uh, and once you get it, you get it. Right? It makes it makes a lot of sense. Then you just the harder thing to do is know what what you're trying to do. So here's an example of the the, um, the XAS designer. And again, we can go to the catalog service and we can look at uh, the the catalog service APIs. Now, this is the, the use case I'm going to walk you guys through. Um, through the catalog service, again, we're talking about consumption, um, consumption of VRA programmatically. Uh, what we're going to do is query the query all catalog items. And based on my bearer token, the authentication, the entitlement I have, it'll respond to me saying, hey, here are all your, um, here's everything you have access to. And then I can query that uh, and I can, um, I can uh, then uh, post that JSON uh, to actually make a request. Okay, really straightforward. Um, and at that point, I could then query existing items or provisioned items, and I could modify them through day two operations. And we can just keep doing this over and over again. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to switch over to, is this where it is? Where do I have it? Okay, here's my postman. Is it, let's see. Yep, that's where I want to be. 
Let me close this guy. PowerPoint keeps a, uh, a ghost window open when you get out of full screen. Okay, so Postman. Um, now, uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, I'm very cognizant of all of you on the call or anybody watching this video who's just trying to get started here. So um, what I wanted to do is just walk through the full setup and before getting here, but again, in an hour, there's absolutely no way we can do that. So what I'm doing is, here's my blog, and I am gonna walk you through um, the the step-by-step -step of installing Postman, um, why, why it's cool, how to use it, and how to make that first catalog request, and setting up your environments and all that stuff. Um, I am about 30 minutes from hitting send on this thing. After the call, I'll wrap this up and hit send, uh, and then share this blog post with you guys. Uh, this is the, the use case I'm gonna walk you through right now. Okay, so I wanted to send it out before this call, but uh, I'm on the road and didn't have the time I thought I had. Okay, oops, not that. Um, in Postman, in VRA, here's my VRA environment. Uh, I've got my catalog, and I've got to authenticate. This is VRA 7.3, latest version. Um, so here's my catalog. What I'm gonna do is just query the catalog. It's gonna respond with a whole bunch of stuff. I'm gonna search for uh, something called CentOS and I'm gonna request it. So I can do that by opening up this UI, logging in, going to the catalog tab. You, you can't shortcut to the catalog tab yet. Going down to the IS catalog or searching for it and then clicking master and then providing some inputs. Uh, under the CentOS machine, and voila, right? And then hit submit. Uh, at submit, it'll go through all kinds of steps, entitlements, uh, or I'm sorry, governance, and, and maybe approvals, maybe based on a configuration, uh, something unique happens, right? It, it's, it could be anything, but I wanna abstract all of that. I wanna send a, a single payload via my API, and I just want it all done. I never wanna look at it at a UI, so. Let's go and do that. Sorry about that. Uh, where am I? Here we are. So now to get started, what I've done is I've got a bunch of environments in here already. I will um, I will walk you through. In fact, one of our peers, when uh, when we released that VMware Code stuff, one of our peers, um, engineer, did a really nice guide. I uh, I wish I had that available to me um, to show you guys. But I had a really nice guide on getting started with Postman. Um, I will locate that URL and share it with you guys as well. It's it, it helps you understand environments and all that. But this is relatively straightforward. Um, so what I've done is I've got environments for all my labs. Um, so the lab I'm in right now is uh, this, uh, this lab. Uh, no, VRA 7.3. And I've got a whole bunch of uh, oops, I've got a whole bunch of uh, attributes pre-configured in there. And those attributes are designed to, um, to make using uh, re repetitive attributes very easy uh, without having to go and, and redo them. Um, so let's go ahead and close this. I'm gonna select that um, environment. And when I select that environment, those uh, environmentals become available um, across uh, the environment. So if you look here, I've got a, a sample post and I've got these bracket bracket um, VA FQDN. In my environment, in my environment settings, I have VA dash FQDN equals something. Um, and for when I select this environment, it equals this FQDN. So that when I'm posting and, and following uh, links and posting uh, repetitive uh, calls, I'm not having to redo all of this um, uh, over and over. From a header's perspective, um, accepting content type, uh, application JSON. Again, this is just uh, very basic stuff, but I wanted to cover it with you. Okay, so now let's look at this. The Postman um, collection that you download from VMware Code, the, it all starts with VMware samples. Now, as you can see, it's got a little bit of everything. 
uh, and they're really great use cases, and it covers a lot of the getting started stuff. Uh, so we can create approvals, for example. Um, we can um, create an approval policy programmatically. We've got a lot of uh, actions we can take on pending approvals that are waiting for us. Uh, we can do all of that uh, programmatically. You probably won't use Postman to do that because it's easier to click on a link, but what if I have a third-party component that needs to hit VRA's APIs and programmatically approve a request, right? That's where you got to put your mind. Um, catalog service, uh, uh, catalog item request submission. So the, the cool thing about the package is it walks you through um, you know, the, the logical steps you would take to do this. So log in as a consumer. So let's go ahead and log in as a consumer. I can see my headers. I can, uh, so I'm gonna click on that. You can see it shows up in the tab. The body just uses all these wildcards. Um, these are the, the, uh, the environmentals I set up in my environment. Um, so I've got username, password, and tenant. Now, those are three prerequisites that are detailed in the docs, regardless of which docs you, you're looking for, that will um, be required to grab a bearer token and, and then be able to use that bearer token in my payload moving forward. So let's go ahead and send this. Um, bearer tokens by default have a 24 hour expiry and you could modify that um, in your uh, in your global settings. So you can make this smaller, you could make this greater. Um, typically the 24 hour thing works fine. Um, now here's what's interesting. I just logged in using my username and password into this environment and I created, a, I received a bearer token. Every time you make this query, it is a unique bearer token, okay? So log in as consumer, I got my token. It starts with uh, inside the quotes and ends in this double uh, dash. And what I'm gonna do is just right click here and I'm gonna set that as my token variable. Postman is just awesome in, in letting you do this kind of stuff. So now that token lives um, in my variables so I could move on to the next thing. So based on that token, um, I am going to now log in with an authorization of bearer and that token wildcard. Let's hit send, and there we have it. So what this uh, call does to the um, entitled catalog items gives me a view of all entitled catalog items. So me as a consumer, I'm hitting the consumer API here, um, regardless of my role as tenant admin or IaaS admin or, or application architect, um, VRA has this concept of entitlement, and based on that entitlement, I can see the services that are available to me. Cool. Now, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and search for that CentOS machine. So let's go uh, CentOS. Uh, quick question, John. Yeah. Um, does the VRA UI use only the VRA API? Does VRA UI use only the VRA API? Um, I think the answer is yes for all the uh, in, you know for all the integrated or native logic. Yes, but keep in mind VRA has this massive e uh, extensibility engine, and when 10% of everything you do is a component of extensibility, I will then hand that off to my extensibility um, platforms like VRealize uh, Orchestrator. Um, I'll I'll hit my event broker. I will do uh, I, I will hand it off to other components. So native native controls, yes, VRA API. Not native controls, I will hand to my um, ecosystem of tools. Gotcha. Thank you. No problem. Um, all right. So if we look through this request, for example. Uh, we are going to, oh, I don't know why only one CentOS machine pulled up, but you can see the payload here. This is the response payload to um, the, the the full set of catalog services uh, that, that came to me. Now, I'm only, I'm not seeing the ones I wanted. Okay, well, let's look at this Windows 2000. Uh, 12 master. 
uh, so I don't waste more time. So if I go back into my catalog, IaaS, I've got uh, Windows 2012 R2 Master. I hit the request here just to show you what that looks like. Um, so he's going to request something called a placement. This is a, uh, re a reservation policy. And what else have I got? I've also got a size um, profile. These are all VRA 7.3 things we could use, uh, size profile. So uh, um, looking at this uh, catalog item, now one of the things I can do um, with this API and with Postman is link directly into the request. So here's the get request template. So I can click on this directly. And when I click on that, I can, oh, there's a way to, let me, let me fix something real quick. Okay, um, so I have this that request that was linked from my, um, my my previous payload, and I could hit send there. All right, and there's my JSON payload. So now I'm looking at this. This is the the uh, JSON code for the individual catalog item, and I queried it, and I can see all that is. Um, all that is, is just going to the bottom, yep. Um, all that is required there. So for example, I've got uh, capacity for storage. I've got my uh, archive days. I've got all these requirements. Now one caveat of using the template uh, or using this JSON and using the API is that I don't have my boundaries available to me. And just to show you what I'm talking about, back here, I can see that um, for, well in this case, um, the size is, is a profile, but in my instances, I've got one to 10. So if I look at my, so if I request, obviously I can't even request 11. Uh, if I look at my JSON here and, and I look at the, um, the number of instances, if I were to type 11, I will certainly be able to post this, but it won't let me uh, it, it will obviously fail because it's outside the boundary. So the enforcement is going to happen post post or after posting, if that makes sense. So let's go ahead and, and grab that content. And I'm gonna go back into my initial um, query and jump down to submit request. Let's go ahead and click that. And the submit request, um, there's ways to set up Postman by the way, so that you don't have to keep doing these um, uh, presets, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, post that, and my body is going to be the body of that JSON. Okay, so now this is the post URI, or the post um, uh, API that I'm going to hit up for that very specific blueprint that I created. Okay, uh, I pasted I copied and pasted the JSON that I can now modify. So here, for example, I can say, I can change requested for, and because I'm a business group manager, for example, I could request this on behalf of somebody else. I can put um, any, any other user there. My archive days, I can say, I want this to be, uh, well, actually archive days is here, number of uh, instances. I'm gonna make two. Um, the CPUs, um, we have a, a, a boundary that we have to use also that is uh, made in the blueprint. And again, as a consumer of the API, I don't necessarily have visibility into that. So you have to plan accordingly. You have to understand what your boundaries are. Um, it is not as easy as just whatever I type will work. Um, things like memory. Also, I have to understand. Um, I have to understand the impact of, of modifying all of that. But let's just go ahead and hit send here. I'm not going to make um, additional changes. Uh, maybe I'll do a. Oops. I'm gonna hit send. 
Okay, status 201 created uh, means that the state has been submitted and it accepted um, all my inputs. Now, if there was any error with authentication, with uh, config or anything like that, it would have failed. Uh, I would have gotten some other status. But this looks promising, so all I did is uh, have to hit send, and or uh, I'm sorry, I posted it. Let's look back at our environment and look at requests. I got that email, and he failed, probably because I didn't set the size attribute. Yeah, so the placement and size attributes, or size was uh, was done, placement was not done. So the bottom line is, when I am requesting these uh, components, I gotta make sure and uh, fulfill all the prereqs. Now, at request time, you can see that I have the star here, which and there's no default. If there's no default, I have to know exactly um, which, uh, which reservation policy I wanna use. Okay, so this is ops priv cloud. Let's go into my API. I'm gonna go that same one. Reservation policy ID, and hit paste. Send that guy. Okay, he was created. Look at my requests, and he's in progress. Okay. That's my take two. So um, very fundamental example, very basic. Um, there's just a couple of steps. As you can see, when I've actually sent and posted that ops priv cloud, that's my reservation policy, I, I needed to know that that was a requirement. Um, what the JSON does not show is that it was in fact a requirement. And these are some of the caveats that you would deal with in, in any API, right? You have to understand that based on your access, based on a configuration, based on some boundary, you have to live within those boundaries. Um, and one of the things that holds true for this use case and VRA is that all boundaries are enforced and they are strictly enforced. There is no circumventing entitlements, no circumventing um, uh, any, any boundaries, no circumventing governance or any of those controls, which is what makes this very attractive for the business type, right? Um, and the compliance type. So that was it, that was a quick, um, a quick request. Now if you go, go in here, um, at that point you can check, you can actually go in catalog service, you can look at uh, uh, request tracking, so you can get catalog requests for a, a given user. Um, and I'm going to do this on behalf of myself. So um, I was the one who requested that. Let me see if this is still authenticated at mgt.local. And there's my request. Um, the state was successful, so I can, um, instead of uh, shooting and waiting to see what happens, I can just kick this off as an API user, or again, as a, some other programmatic interface, another tool, another solution, to check status on a machine as it goes on. Um, and, and we can do it this way. This is just like going into my execution info. Um, I can see that this guy's still in progress, and I had an allocation request fail because of placement, but anyways, this is where um, that information would be shown. Uh, regardless of whether or not I had resources to provision this thing, uh, all other all other rules apply. All right, so gosh, I need another two hours easily. Um, so what I'm gonna, <laughs> well, I mean, I barely I barely went through the first use case. I had six uh, lined up, but what I wanted to do um, is at least walk you through what I just showed you, and uh, and again, look for this. I will post it and hashtag the brown bag, uh, and it'll walk you th through setting up Postman for those who, who haven't gotten it set up. I'll also cool. share some, some additional uh, links and helpful stuff, and then, of course, always available for uh, questions or follow-on or whatever else you need to know, and, and maybe we can 
in the future do another session and, and go uh, deep into the um, into some deeper use cases more I, actually there are there are several comments to exact alluding exactly to that so, sounds like uh, two more v brown bag sessions right there uh, from yeah. from, a, from a couple of the different uh, listeners right now <laughs> awesome all right so this would be the 101 right and then we'll uh, we can take it from here um, Perfect. after that All right, and if we don't have any other questions, or or do we? And I'll hand it back to you. Uh, no, no, it's. It, I mean, everybody's is uh, v being very effusive about how awesome this is. Uh, but I, I think they're um, they're all just kind of like uh, um, you know d doing the uh, deer in the headlights right now. This is this was fantastic, but it's it, it is a as you said, it's a it's a mountain of information. This was this was a fire hose. This is awesome. Very cool. I, I guess that's cool. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, we can uh, we can we can take it in any direction in the future. Well, I mean, you know, try, trying to squeeze all this into one hour is is uh, you know a, a, a monstrous task to begin with. So so I, I think that um, it's it's definitely um, very useful. And and we we de yeah. So so Ken is Ken says I'm profoundly dumbfounded right now. Uh, Graham is saying there's there's so much more that needs to be dived into. Uh, so yeah, there's, yep. there's there's definitely a ton of interest in this. I, I think they, they need to go away and digest for a little bit, as as do I. <laughs> yeah, one of the common requests was scale. Um, I got that three or four times about the scale in scale out API. Um, what I think I'll do is post that as a blog post very soon as well as a follow on to this 101. Um, just because that that's where I wanted to do next, and I'll I'll just post that as a how to. And um, and we can cover other topics like uh, actual management and config or um, or third party tools or whatever it is in the future. Yeah, that that would be awesome. We have a we have a couple of VRA guys at, at my company um, that that are listening right now, and, and they're I, I know that they're going to be picking my brains about you know a follow up webinar on this um, uh, because because of the things that they're running into as well. So so this this was absolutely fantastic, Chad. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And um, until next time. Cool. Uh, th thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, have, have a great evening, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Take care.